Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Stay Healthy at Home webinar series. So I see folks are filing into the webinar right now. I'm just gonna give everybody a couple seconds to get situated and get their uh, setup all ready. All right, folks are filing in, so timely. And again, thank you all for joining us today. We very much appreciate the support for the weekly Stay Healthy at Home webinar series. My name is Ashley Ritchie, and I'm the director of the New Jersey Self Advocacy Project, which is a program of the ARC of New Jersey. So I'm really thrilled to announce that today we have a fantastic guest presenter. Um, and before I get to that introduction, I would just like to remind everybody that you are more than welcome to submit questions, comments, and feedback in the questions box. You can find that by checking out your GoToWebinar control panel and scrolling down to the little triangle next to questions. So you can type your questions right there and a member of our team will be keeping an eye on the questions box. Uh, no need to submit duplicate questions. We're going to make sure that every question is addressed at the end of the webinar during our question and answer session. So as I said, I am so thrilled to introduce today's guest presenter, Wesley E. Anderson. Wesley is the Director of Training and Consultation Services at the ARC of New Jersey, where he provides technical assistance and customized workshops to supported employment agencies and schools throughout the state a certified practitioner of the teaching family model and traumatic brain injury specialist, Wesley has been providing supports to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities for over 10 years. He started his career in special education and later, support, and later supported employment as an employment specialist and job developer. A proven networker, Wesley was appointed by the Chamber of Commerce Southern New Jersey to their ambassador committee. In his current role, Wesley sits on the National Board of Directors for APSI, the Association for Professionals Supporting Employment First, and chairs APSI's Professional Development Committee. So thanks so much, Wes. We look forward to the presentation. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, thank you, all of the staff um, at the Self-Advocacy uh, Group for organizing this and for putting this together. Um, today, we're here to talk about boundaries, uh, healthy professional boundaries, which is a topic that I think is always in the fringes of our consciousness, uh, whether or not we're providing services or receiving them. But oftentimes, uh, the advice given is more uh, do this thing rather than how and why. And one of the worst things that can happen is inadvertently creating a situation uh, that sets up for conflict or difficulty in the future uh, while having the best intentions. And that's a lot of the times where we see things. So let's start with a basic understanding of what I like to call the zone of helpfulness. Uh, this is where we all want to be. This is that end of the day after providing services where you feel like you have made an impact on somebody's life for the positive you anticipated that uh, that issue, that, that barrier, um, and you've done a great job of uh, preventing something that could be uh, worse. Uh, oftentimes, uh, on the far end, we have under-involved. This is where we didn't pick up that call or we have disconnected from the client somehow and we aren't being our best provider self. For somebody receiving services, this also can occur when we are disengaged from services, when we are not returning phone calls or completing objectives. We definitely don't want this. But the one that we don't talk about very often is over-involved. And this, that over-involved space is what we're going to look at and define. What does it look like? How do I know that I'm doing too much? How do I know that I have set myself up 
to have a precedent of continuing to do too much. And as a person providing services or as a person receiving services, what are the warning signs and consequences of being over involved? This part is what we mean when we have a lack of professional boundaries. So what does it look like? Well, it starts with uh, having healthy communications um, and role modeling those healthy communications and professional relationships, which means that anytime you're interacting with someone that you are providing services for, um, whether or not you're on the phone with a coworker, a supervisor, you need to always keep in mind that what you're showing is going to be an example that they can take moving forward when they are conducting themselves professionally, which means you want to refrain from uh, using poor language or from uh, yelling at somebody on the phone because they've interrupted you. Even things like rolling your eyes while you're on the phone uh, can set a, a negative message. And this doesn't mean that you have to be perfect, but it means that you should be intentional. Uh, don't put out a message that you aren't willing to have quoted back to you. Uh, it means avoiding the rescuer role, which we will talk about in depth, uh, staying focused on our responsibilities to and as the client. This part often happens when you are one of those really good-hearted people who got into this business because you wanted to do good work, and you are working with somebody who maybe has multiple areas in their life where you feel like you could help. Uh, it's important to remind ourselves that we can't be all things for all people and to focus on what part of our task, what part of our goal as a service provider aligns with the, the areas that we can impact and kind of keep it to those areas. Avoiding burnout, uh, slash compassion fatigue, as, as we call it. Um, this is ultimately a, a rollover effect, it, and it snowballs, where people who are really good at the work, who really put their hearts and souls into it, find that over time, they just can't do it anymore. And a lot of that has to do with a lack of setting firm boundaries in the beginning. A work-life balance is incredibly important in any field, but especially one where one of the, the biggest components to making you successful is your ability to empathize and your ability to reach people emotionally. You have to make sure that you save room for yourself. Uh, and lastly, um, both working in conjunction with other providers, uh, and maintaining one's physical and emotional safety. Now this last one is one that we're gonna to touch on in depth. So let's start with a question. Is physical touch sometimes okay, always okay, or never okay? We have 67% say sometimes okay, and 33% say never okay. Uh, and this is this is a tough one. Um, I would lean towards sometimes okay, but if you chose never okay, that is not an incorrect answer. The decision between whether or not it's sometimes and always okay is valid. I'm glad I got zero responses for always okay. Some people, uh, a pat on the back or a handshake or what we call the sideways hug where uh, you make sure that you're you're, you're uh, hugging with the side of your hip and not uh, front on front. Sometimes in some settings that can be okay. But the decision should happen ahead of time, not in the moment. What is your stance on physical contact, contact and make sure that whoever you're working with is aware of that right off of the bat. Is it okay to disclose things about your personal life? 
we have 56% say sometimes okay and 44% say never okay. Uh, this also is a sometimes okay. Um, the level of personal information that you share should be restricted to things directly related to the goals that you're working on directly related to furthering the, the individual's goals that you're working with. If it is something that is nice to know, that's, that's gonna go under a, a never okay. Um, oftentimes, that's not how this ends up happening though. Oftentimes, we share things because we want to increase our own personal rapport with the client that we're working with, which is one of those really good intentioned things that has the capacity to backfire. I'll give you an example. I used to work um, in special education uh, and the, the school that I worked with uh, had individuals who were at risk um, and sometimes it would become physical. Um, and as a staff member in a classroom, I had a really, really good rapport with all of the, the, the kids in that classroom. Um, they would listen to me and, and they, sometimes wouldn't listen to other staff members. And there was a part of me that took a lot of pride in that. I thought that that was a sign that I was really good at my job. To a certain extent, that's true. But what ended up happening is I would go on my lunch break, same time every day. And nine times out of 10, when I came back, there would be uh, one of my kids in the middle of a crisis that I would be pulled into because that individual would listen to me. And what was really happening there? It wasn't a healthy, generalized relationship amongst, for, with that kid amongst all the staff. It was a very specific relationship that was not setting that individual up for future success. It was setting them up to be dependent on me being there. And that's not what we want. So if you're sharing information in the hopes that it will make you have a better rapport with a client, you might get what you want, but the question to ask yourselves is if that's in the best interest, that personalized relationship, if it's in the best interest of the client when you know that you're not going to be there forever. Is it okay to conduct personal or uh, professional business with a client? Or with, the, or with somebody that is providing you services, I should say. Now that was quick. We have 78% say never okay. Uh, that would be where I would err as well. Uh, mixing business, uh, outside business with a, uh, a social relationship, a, a human services related relationship is a one way street to abuse. Uh, uh, financial abuse, um, and and it puts you in a very, very precarious situation um, ethically. Uh, there is a, an undue power balance, which we'll talk about in a second, which means that the two people are not operating on the same, uh, the same power level when you are providing somebody services. Uh, so mixing money, and I don't care if it's your kids uh, fundraising activity. Don't sell it to people who you're providing services for. It is wrong, just almost full stop. Uh, I'm glad that we got mostly never okays. Now for the, those that wrote sometimes okay, there might be small examples where someone that you used to provide services for, uh, maybe you've done business with them in the past. The important part is that you disclose that that's the case to your supervisors right away. Um, and they'll let you know their own company policies for that. And the last two, I'm going to include presence and lending under the same question. So this one is actually sometimes, always, or never for presence and lending money, giving or receiving presents and lending money. 
Okay. 88% said never okay. Uh, absolutely. Um, as far as lending money, that again is a a straight path to potentially exploitive behavior. Uh, it's it's definitely not something that we want to see, um, and it puts you in a difficult position when if a personal relationship has led you to be able to feel comfortable lending money to one individual. Do you feel comfortable lending it to all the individuals that you serve? If the answer is no, you have to look at why that one relationship is different. Um, and it most likely is because there is a gray line where a firm pro professional boundary should be. As far as giving and receiving presents, for the sometimes okay, I can see why we might get there. It depends on what the present is, right? Um, a good way to look at this is to not necessarily look at the fringe cases, like the it being like a, a handmade picture or something like that, and to think about if you would feel comfortable having somebody, having a teacher say that it's okay for them to exchange presents and to receive presents from your child. Um, you might say it depends on what it is, but as a general rule, probably not. Uh, a common problem is not the giving of presents, but receiving presents. Uh, there's a lot of times where people would make me food, things like that. Most of the time, if it's the first time it's happened and I haven't been on the ball enough to say that I don't do that, most of the time I will thank them very much for it, but I'll say, unfortunately, I can't accept that, but thank you so much. Why don't you share it with XYZ, uh, another client or something like that? Uh, but it's important for these types of things to set the groundwork early. That way you don't find yourself in the position to unwittingly, uh, uh, unwittingly hurt somebody's feelings. And we're gonna skip socializing for now because we're going to come to that in a second. So what are some landmarks, uh, what are some consequences of having loose professional boundaries? Um, they're numerous, but one of the first ones that we're gonna look at is the kind of degradation of, of, of our service system and how it makes us look when there is the impression of unfair bias or unfair expectations. And that can happen in a positive way and in a negative way. So going beyond what you're supposed to do above and beyond is great in the moment, but it can also create inconsistent expectations that everybody should do that. And when one person does something that, you know, I'm gonna go to my client's house and help them move, that might create the impression that, well, that's just what people do. That's what they're supposed to do. And the next person that comes around that says, no, I don't do that, that's not what I'm here for, you will find they get a negative response um, unfairly. So it really confuses things and it erodes confidence over time, not only in an organization, but in the human services field in general. So that I think is the main consequence. There are personal consequences as well. Um, the ability to be held legally culpable, but I'm not a lawyer. Jessica Oppenheim, who is uh, the director of uh, uh, the Criminal Justice Advocacy Program, could give a much better uh, talk on that than I could. But I can say why it's difficult. The main reason why it's difficult to maintain professional boundaries is that there is an inherent power imbalance between a worker and client. Um, and the worker is often perceived as having more power and control. Now, whether or not that perception is correct, there is a power imbalance. One of the main things that, uh, cases where you can see evidence that there might be a skewed or gray line, uh, as far as professional boundaries are concerned, is if a client or a provider of services, if they refer to each other as friends. I don't know about you, but I don't have to pay anyone to be friends with me. 
there are people that I would want to be friends with that I couldn't pay them enough to be friends with me. You don't get to exchange money for friendship. And lest we be confused, whether or not you're paying the service provider directly, your benefits, whether it's uh, Medicaid, whether or not it's a voucher, whether or not it's any type of uh, entitlement, that money is paying for services. So if you are receiving money to be there, you're not their friend. And I see a lot of people push back on that because we want to be friendly and we put our hearts and souls into our work and we want, we don't want friend to be a bad word, but if you understand the power imbalance, if you look around to an individual that you're serving, if when you ask them who their friends are, if the only people that they are pointing at are people that are paid to be there, it's a failure on our part to provide opportunities for them to make meaningful relationships outside of us. It's If I go back to my example at the special education school, it was my failure to make sure that the kids in my class had opportunities to socialize with the other staff members so that they could have beneficial relationships. And at the, in the front of our mind at all times, whenever you have a, a situation like the polls that I asked before, the real question is, what is the power imbalance here? And is this making it better or worse? One of the other reasons is dual relationships. This is when a client and a service provider uh, know each other from another setting. And this is one of those almost unavoidable ones. It's going to happen eventually. But the question is, just because you know somebody uh, from your son or daughter's little, little league games, doesn't mean that you have to provide them services. If there's another person that could handle that case, the first question is to ask, can that other person do that? Um, the second thing to do, regardless, is to immediately disclose that you know this person from another setting and to have a conversation right off the bat that says, just because we know each other here does not mean that that relationship should influence the work that we're doing professionally. One that we often don't talk about are values conflicts. A values conflict is when the client's choices, their lifestyle, uh, how they feel about certain things directly butts heads with how we feel or our best practices. Uh, and this is a tough one. The first thing that you have to consider is how much should my personal feelings be involved in my work in general? This often happens politically. Um, how much should my politics interact with my work? That is a personal choice. But the real question is, have you disclosed that importance to the people you work for? Because it's one thing to have strong personal convictions. Uh, it's another thing to use those convictions to make service-related decisions without those decisions being backed by your organization. So there are some, uh, I, I do consultations for providers. There are some providers I know that uh, choose not to work with certain clientele. Uh, now, I neither agree nor disagree with that, but as an agency-wide decision, that is that agency's choice to make as long as they are doing it ethically and legally. Uh, but for an individual practitioner to make that decision, then you need to have the backing of the organization and the law. And the last one that we'll talk about is uh, vicarious trauma. Um, this is when a service provider has had similar traumatic experiences to the client. And that might bring up kind of negative, difficult emotions to grapple. In some cases, it might be why the person got into this business, but it doesn't make it any less difficult. And the best advice I can give you is 
you need to find someone, uh, preferably somebody that understands the field that you're in, but it doesn't have to be. It can also be somebody completely separate, but you need to find someone who you can, while maintaining all ethics and HIPAA compliance, um, that you can talk to about how you're feeling. Uh, commonly, that uh, a social worker or a counselor or a therapist or a supervisor, someone with whom you can say, hey, I'm having a difficult time right now, and that can provide you some perspective. The worst thing that you can do for your own mental health is to not address how you're feeling because you also have a right to feel negative, difficult emotions. Uh, which leads us to one of the, the main aspects, which is, uh, I kind of hinted at it before, all of this comes down to playing the hero role, where we feel the need to save the client that we're working with. And I'll say it right now, they don't need to be saved. Uh, any individual that you're working with is a full faceted individual with just like anybody else, complex likes and dislikes, uh, benefit, uh, pros and cons to them. Um, we're not here to fix people. We're here to help them accomplish their goals, no matter what service you're in. Um, so if we move from the mentality of fixing people to helping them, a lot of the things that we might do to fix a problem, we can find other solutions to. A common example in supported employment is uh, driving somebody to work. Um, you can fix their transportation issues by driving them to work, but you will help them by teaching them how to use public transportation, for instance. We've all heard that old adage, uh, give a man a fish, feed them for a day, teach them how to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. It's kind of that. Um, when we put ourselves in the position of having to save the client, it not only is unfair to them, but it's unfair to us because that's a lot of pressure. Saving somebody's life is a lot of pressure. And there's nothing worse than doing everything that you can and feeling like not only that you didn't get what you wanted, but that you've failed at this profound level. And that is not the case. Um, if we all do our part, if we all avoid poor teamwork, um, we can kind of still maintain that healthy work-life balance. This last one is uh, one that I've struggled with before. Um, if you are an overachiever, if you kind of put that label onto yourself, you might feel sometimes that other people aren't going to do as good of a job as you can. Um, and if you believe that, uh, then you might take over their roles. Again, that example with the special education school, would there other times where somebody could have addressed a behavior that somebody was having? Probably, but I didn't think that they'd do it as well as I would. So I stepped in. And over time, people stopped stepping up. Uh, and this creates resentment and, and poor coordination overall. So, those are some of the major factors of why it's difficult. Um, here are some kind of signs uh, that, that we might uh, use to walk the line. As early as possible, you want to have a conversation where you establish firm, concrete agreements, and you want to have this in writing. Now, the first time you do this, it's gonna be crap because there are so many areas that, that you'll forget about. But over time, as you encounter difficult situations, you wanna go back to this document and you wanna add them as well. So for instance, when you first start out, you might not think about when you turn your work phone off. But after working for a while, you might know, hey, I turn my phone off at 5 p.m. every evening. And so it's worthwhile to tell anybody that you're working with, regardless of what's going on, I turn my phone off at 5 p.m. 
please leave me a message at that point. Don't expect to get a hold of me. If it's emergency, contact this person. Now you might have that policy in your mind, but this is about being transparent. So you need to share that information, share your preferences with the person sitting across from you, which also gives them the ability to share their preferences with you. Uh, for instance, in uh, when I was doing intakes as a job coach, um, I had a, a very firm rule that uh, whenever I was having a meeting with an individual and maybe their families, that any questions that I was asking, unless I said, you know, I was directing it to the family, was directed towards the individual first to get their input. And then, of course, I would go to the family for more input. But that's my expectation. It doesn't matter unless I put it in writing. And it gives me the ability to explain why to the families. And I never had a family have a problem with that. Um, so communicate what and how you do what you do uh, and things like what to do if you see each other in public. When a issue or a warning sign appears, make sure you address them with the client quickly. Uh, you want to emphasize that this is not about your individual relationship. This is about protecting you and them and every future person that you're serving by making sure that you're treating them fairly the way you treat everybody else. Um, know that just because you explain that doesn't mean that uh, it's not going to be met with hurt feelings potentially which is why pre-teaching is so important. You want to avoid surprises if at all possible, but when they come, you don't want to run from them. You want to address them head on. If you do decide to share personal information, as I said in the beginning, make sure that it's related to the client's goals. Um, there is a common kind of pattern where over time in the service relationship, it becomes less about the goals and it becomes more about the interpersonal relationship. And that is something that you, we definitely want to avoid. If you are receiving services, this is something that you also have to be careful with. Um, over time, as a person that's provided services, it's very easy to get your eye off of the ball, let's just say I my goal was to find somebody a job, to and for it to kind of shift to, I want this person to just be happier overall. And then you start inserting yourself in different places where you don't need to be. As somebody receiving services, do not be afraid to tell the person that that's not any of their business, <laughs> that I'm we're here to do this thing or I don't need help with this, I need help with this. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable um, doing that, you need to find someone who can advocate with you. Uh, notice I didn't say for you, advocate with you. And as a service provider, you should be asking, do you need my help with that? And not assuming that the person does. Remember that Again, just because you say something doesn't mean that the message is going to be received in exactly the way you want to. So the worst thing that you can do in this circumstance is have very firm boundaries that you never ever revisit over the course of your uh, service relationship. You need to constantly go back over and reaffirm that you both are on the same page. Uh, if things have changed, you need to go back and sit back down and say, how does this affect where we're at? Um, make it a question, have a conversation. When you are having these types of conversations, it's important that you ask the person, regardless of if you are receiving or providing services, to repeat back what you said. Because what they'll end up doing is they'll put it in their words as they understand it. And that gives you the ability to ask questions to clarify. Use your supervisors, 
use other staff if you trust them um, as a sounding board when you have questions. Hey, is this okay? I'm not quite sure. Um, that is something that even if the answer is still a gray area, you never know how getting kind of advanced warning about a potential conflict will help somebody else in the future make better choices. It's a it's a ripple effect. We're all connected in this in this work. So if things are impacting your ability to be objective, let's just say that uh, you strongly disagree with the way somebody is living their life for whatever reason, and you feel like it's gotten to the point where you can't be objective anymore, please don't keep providing them services. Please tell somebody so that you can go to where your strengths are uh, to a different case, perhaps, um, and, and so that you can remain objective and, and maintain your professional integrity. For supervisors, please recognize that this conversation is right off the bat a difficult one. The reason that I didn't start this with a preamble about, you know, I'm not speaking to anybody specific, that this is not about your personal choices, it's about a trend in services, is because I strongly believe that that conversation means a lot more when it's coming from somebody that you directly work with. So for supervisors, if you see something that makes you question what's going on, go into it with an open mind and recognize that any questions that you ask will probably cause some degree of defensiveness. And so instead of saying, you know, as I said in the beginning, just have better boundaries, just be better, uh, use questions kind of like the questions that I asked, the polling questions that I asked in the beginning to help them identify where their boundaries are because it's going to be different from everybody. And the question then is, this is where you are. Are these boundaries firm enough? Are they sustainable? And the same thing happens if you're receiving services. Uh, it's worthwhile for you to ask other individuals that are receiving services, if you know them. Ask them, hey, how would you handle this situation? Your, uh, you, somebody that's providing you services gets you two tickets to a baseball game. How would you handle that? I would be very interested to see how other people handle that situation and whether or not their boundaries would land where yours are. And lastly, um, take care of yourself. A lot of what ends up being overlooked, especially in these days, uh, is our own mental health and wellness. Make sure you are getting plenty of sleep, make sure you're eating well, make sure you're spending time disconnected from your devices, especially your work devices, um, exercising and, and being with friends and family to whatever degree that you can. Um, leaving work at work is important because work is not your life and if it is you probably have a, a blurring of boundaries there as well and the same advice that i'm giving here applies to our work life as well clear boundaries that you communicate with the people that need to know them if you turn your phone off at a certain time make sure that your supervisor knows that uh, any organization that 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 wants great people um, and this is something like at the Ark of New Jersey that we very much value. We value the, the, the work-life balance. Um, so make sure that you have a conversation with your organization about that as well. So before we go, I have a, uh, a case study, two of them for you. Here are some questions to consider as you go over them. One, what is the boundary issue? Two, how could this issue affect the client? How could it affect the worker? And what could have been done differently to establish and maintain healthy boundaries? So I'm gonna read the first one to you and then I welcome in the chat any feedback that you guys have, any of your thoughts. So 
Harvey is a new staff member at a group home for teen boys. During his first week on the job, one of the boys, Larry, asked Harvey to take him to the DMV to get his driver's license on his 17th birthday, and Harvey agreed to do so. When Harvey arrived for his shift, two days before Larry's birthday, he found out from the group home staff that Larry had failed two classes and ended the school year with a 2.0 GPA. Now the rules of the group home are that residents must have a 2.5 GPA with no failing classes in order to test for the driver's license. So Harvey avoided Larry that day and he didn't sleep that night because he was so stressed out about the situation. The next day, he met with Larry and told him he wouldn't be able to take him to get his license because of the 2.5 GPA requirement. There's one more part, but so far, how has Larry, how do you think Larry has handled this situation so far? And Wes, I just wanted to share one comment that we received before from Sarah. She, uh, Sarah says that they were told never to mix business with pleasure. So in the case scenario you discussed before, Sarah says that they would not display any personal info on the job. So I think that really just speaks to the firm establishment of boundaries from the start. I agree 100%. Uh, there was a, Sarah, that it's a great point. One of the ongoing um, uh, kind of games that, that the kids in my class used to try to figure out was how old I was. Um, and I'm proud to say that in five plus years of working there, they never figured it out uh, because it was not relevant. How old I was wasn't relevant. I was old enough to be there. <laughs> All right, so we're getting some, uh, uh, Larry should have had his supervisor help him break the news so it didn't linger uh, and keep him up that night. Uh, he should have used some of his supports to help him do the job better. It isn't Larry, it isn't um, his rule, it's the Holmes rule. Uh, yes, uh, I see you meant Harvey, absolutely. Uh, that's a great solution, by the way, that, that's not even in here, Help having your supervisor help break the news. Um, but let's see how, what Larry did. Uh, Larry, uh, the individual who wanted to get his driver's license, became upset and stated the rule didn't make any sense because academics have nothing to do with driving. So Harvey, who's the staff member, he vented with Larry about the situation and finally said, it sucks you can't get your license because of some stupid group home rule. So what do we think about that? That's not professional response. I agree 100%. <laughs> yes, uh, the response was unprofessional for sure, uh, considering Harvey works there at that stupid, <laughs> at the home that has the stupid rule. Yeah, it's kind of counterproductive. Um, another comment says, uh, I can understand academics have nothing to do with your license, but rules are rules. So that, if you believe that, which I, I, I agree with, the question is whether or not that sentiment is important, right? Um, does it help? Does it help Larry to know that Harvey agrees with him? Another way to ask that is, who does it help? As a staff member, he needs to back the rules and maybe help Harvey understand why the rule. Yeah, it helps Harvey for. Uh, it helps Harvey's personal relationship to publicly agree with Larry that the rule stinks or, you know, that he gets it. Um, the only person it helps is Harvey. It helps Harvey have a better relationship with Larry, but it doesn't really help Larry because it's not going to change it. All it does is create a little mini team inside of the group home, which should be a team altogether. So as you're looking at this, a couple of things can kind of pop out at you. Uh, it was Harvey's first week on the job. So maybe Harvey should not be agreeing to do things before he knows all of the rules of the establishment, right? It's Harvey's first week on the job. And if somebody comes up to you 
my first thing would be, well, let me check and see if I'm allowed to do that. The difficulty is that Harvey did promise. And then he found out, as, as Aaron mentioned, he found out a, a while before, but he avoided Larry. And then, of course, you all highlighted the stupid group home rule. So let's do one more, because you guys absolutely knocked that one out of the park. Uh, Claudia has been working with Sarah, a mother of three children, on vocational training and financial planning for the past year. During their time together, Sarah talked some with Claudia about her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Eddie. Eddie is the father of Sarah's two younger children and is an undocumented migrant farm worker. Based on what Sarah has disclosed about Eddie, Claudia believes he is quite possessive and has rigid ideas about women's roles versus men's roles. Claudia politically identifies herself as a feminist and finds Eddie's value system offensive. She also doesn't see how he could contribute adequately to the family system because he is undocumented, which, mind you, is incorrect. When Sarah tells Claudia that she and Eddie have reconciled, Claudia tells Sarah that she believes Eddie is no good for her since he is sexist and illegal. She further states that this will only disrupt the children since he is bound to disappear again at some point anyway. After this conversation, Sarah misses her next three appointments with Claudia. What do we think about Claudia? What do we think? First of all, I love any answer that starts with first of all. I agree. First of all, Sarah is sharing, uh, uh, she's sharing too much personal information and drama with Claudia. So Sarah is the is the client. And yes, this is one of those cases where as, as the client, you also need to protect yourself from other people's biases. Um, what you share, even though we're having a, a and I know, I know you might have met um, met Claudia, but Sarah is sharing a lot of information about her boyfriend. Um, and this is one of those cases where, even though there are best practices, you need to make sure that you are protective of yourself, and and only share what you need to when you're receiving services and when you're providing them. But yeah, so what else? What what are other thoughts? Another first of all, yes, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah stop sharing personal inf info with anyone for that matter. Uh, and Claudia has no right to put her opinion in the open like that. Yes, absolutely. If we keep in mind, what was Claudia there to work on? Vocational training and financial planning. Eric, has Claudia overstepped her boundaries? Is not her job to be judgmental of Sarah's situation, uh huh? And Aaron, uh, Claudia is instilling her her views on ideals. Yes, more. Uh, I picked purposefully a a an obvious violation to show. The real question here is, what was Claudia was Claudia thinking? I'm going to be offensive. Was the service writer was she trying to be offensive and hurtful? Do you think? Or did she have what she thought was Sarah's best interest in mind? She was trying to be helpful. She didn't want to see Claudia be hurt. She didn't want to see Claudia's children be hurt. She was trying to care for, and Erica, you, you, hit, you hit it on that. She was trying to care for her quote unquote friend. But, and you're exactly right, but Claudia and, and Sarah are not friends. And while this might be a rough conversation for two friends to have, it is an inappropriate conversation for a serv service provider and a client to have. Uh, somebody says, uh, Claudia should have worded her advice differently. Potentially. If you think that the advice is falls under the umbrella of the vocational training and financial planning, which you could potentially make an argument for in some way, maybe, you still have to be careful uh, because what's the benefit, right? 
what, what's the, it, what's the benefit to your work? Um, Claudia does not see how he could contribute. She doesn't know. Um, if Claudia was going to attempt to give any type of advice, she should look up the options because there definitely are some for continuing to contribute financially. Yeah, uh, didn't need to offer romantic advice. Yeah, uh, as a helpful rule to everybody, uh, this is just for friends, don't give relationship advice. It never ends well. Uh, either you're right and they blame you or you're wrong and they blame you. No, there's no win there. Using loaded language like he is sexist and illegal is not only uh, outside of the purview, but it's insensitive in general. And so as a consequence of this, Sarah misses her next three appointments with Claudia and probably loses her trust as well, permanently. So if you, if there are any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'm just going to leave you with some questions to consider. Uh, and mind you, this whole presentation is in the handouts, but some things to consider is, is this in my client's best interest? Um, the last one on this list is one that I really want to highlight though. Am I comfortable documenting this decision or behavior in the client's file? Or if you're a client, am I comfortable having this decision be documented? Because I can guarantee you that Claudia does not write, I called Sarah's boyfriend sexist. She probably said I gave her advice. That's it. So make sure that you are always keeping an eye out on not just who you are, and this is my final closing advice, keep an eye out on who you want to be. Who, when you look back at your time and your career and your time receiving services, are you being the person that you want to tell stories about later? Are you being that pillar of ethics that says there were tough choices and maybe I didn't make all of the best choices, but I know that I thought through all the choices that I made. And that is what it really means to have professional boundaries. So my name is Wesley Anderson. Thank you all so, so much for joining me today. Um, thank you to the, uh, Self-Advocacy Project for hosting me, um, and I look forward to continuing this conversation in the future. Thank you so much, Wes. This was fantastic. I love that you built an interactive element into the webinar, and thank you to all of the folks who participated and shared their input in the questions box. So thank you so much again, Wes, and I hope that you will all register for next week's session. It is a webinar all about the results of the election. So it is titled, What Comes Next? 2020 Election Results and What They Mean. You can register for the session on the New Jersey Self-Advocacy Project homepage, New Jersey NJS Self-Advocacy Project.org. Thank you again, Wes, and we hope to see you all next week.